they become desperate. They were so humbled by their circumstances that when God showed them the deliverer, they quickly accepted him. It's the same thing with us. Sometimes we pray, but we are not ready to receive. We cry out to God and we say, God, why are you delaying? God says, I just want you to go a little bit lower. A little bit lower. Why? Because if God would answer us at that point in time, we say, ah, it's because I can pray. Oh, it is because of this. It's because I'm a clear word. Whereas God is just showing mercy on you. Very good example. 
somebody like Jacob. Jacob was somebody who is like he, he was in a place where things were difficult for him. And the reason why it was that because God wanted to teach him a few lessons about what life is. And what happened? When it got to the point where Jacob could not cope anymore, he could not fight his small cunning, cunning like a laban. You know what he did? He started praying. He started calling upon God. We don't know for how long he did, but we know that maybe for years. And you see, that's the thing about God. The fact that you start calling today does not guarantee that God will answer today. But he has said, call upon me and I will answer you. So if you dare to call upon God, God is going to answer you. But the timing of his answering us is like it's now dependent upon him. But it can be guaranteed that if you call upon him, he will answer us and he will show us great and mighty things that we do not know. That was what Jacob did. Jacob cried to God and said, Lord God, where I have found myself, I can't do anything about it. God to help me out. And God told him, do this, do this, do this, and you will be set free. So God arose and fought for Jacob. And because he fought for Jacob, he was able to break Jacob out of what was disturbing him. So God doesn't just arise. Something must trigger him. And that something is our prayer. So if you want God to arise in your life, if you are dissatisfied with the status quo and you want something to change, God wants us to go before him in prayer. That's why it matters that we should be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, we should make our request known to God. The second point is that favor is God's response to our prayer. It says, so for yourself in righteousness, you reap in mercy. You know, in life, life is about sowing and reaping. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, for whatever a man soweth, that shall he reap. So if you sow, then you are guaranteed to reap, at least technically. But if you don't sow, then you can't expect anything. So we are saying that when you do so in righteousness, what you will get back is you reap mercy. You know we have defined mercy as part of what makes up favor when you combine it with grace. So when you sow in righteousness, you reap in mercy. Favor is God's response to our prayer. Number three, God will arise based on times and seasons. The Bible says that for everything under the earth, there is a time and there is a season. Just as you have seasons of life, for example, we are in autumn now, soon we will be in winter. Then after some time, we will go to spring. And after some time, we will go to summer. I want you to understand that our lives are shaped or is like a pattern around you. It is like the seasons of life. Just as you have your, your, your spring, that's when it's like when you are young or you are born. You also have your summer, when you are at your glory. You also have your autumn, when it's like you are winding down. And of course, you have your winter, when it's time for you to depart. Understand that the prayer that you pray is determined the way God answers your prayer is determined by the season in which you are. If you are praying for a prayer that God has scheduled for you to, to be in your winter, and you are praying for that prayer in spring, you might have to pray longer. God might say, okay, all right, I've heard you, but you've got to wait. Or God might just leave you and keep you praying until that time comes. So it is whatever this time of your life that determines how God is going to answer that prayer. For example, we've talked, when we've talking about favor of God, we've been talking about how God preselects you, how God prepares you, how God protects you, how God projects you, and how God perfects you. When you are in the stage of preselection, God cannot perfect you because that's not just the stage. When you are in the stage of prevention or protection, when God is keeping you from being prematurely exposed to 
elements of life that can destroy his dream in you. And you are praying, God, now you keep me under undercover. God can't answer that prayer because at that point in time, you need to be undercover. When you are like in the time of projection, God says your time has come. And you are saying, God, I'm shy. I don't want, I, I don't, I don't want, I, I don't want this, this situation. God will say, sorry, this is the time for me to project you. I remember the story that Pastor Adepo said about when, when God told him, that's okay, now we are going to be the general Bashir. He didn't want it. His, himself and his wife, they went and they prayed for days, fasting and prayer. God, take this thing off us. We don't want it. God said, I can't answer that prayer. You are the one that I have chosen. So you have to understand that, you see, the way that God responds, the way that God will arise for you and show mercy on you depends on the time and the season. There are some prayers that we pray that God answers in a different way. I'm sure that Joseph would have been praying when Potiphar's wife was trying in his life to seduce him. And God, get me out of this place. And God answered his prayer. But you know, when God answered his prayer, you know what happened? God promoted him from Potiphar's house and placed him in prison. When you look at a situation like that, you say, ah, God, I thought I said you should deliver me. Why do you deliver me into a prison? Why? Because the time for God to project him, the time for God to perfect him had not come. So God had to put him in a place where Potiphar's wife could never get to him. That is the way it sometimes works in our lives. We are looking for God. Say, God, do this thing, do that thing. And instead of it happening, God will do something else. And you say, ah, God, I never asked for that. That is because God is answering your prayer based on the season of your life. When it was time for God to answer Joseph's prayer, he probably even had to stop praying. But when the time came, it was the Pharaoh that sent for him and he was presented before him. He never went back to that prison again. Why? Because that prison was like an olden pen. A place to keep him safe from Potiphar. A place to develop him further in with respect to God's plan for his life. So understand this. God, God answers our prayers. Every time you pray, God answers. But he answers in three ways. God can say no. Because what's king is against his will. Jesus Christ, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, oh God, if it's possible, let this cup pass over me. Why? Because he didn't want to die that kind of death. You know, God never answered. Jesus Christ just felt a cold front from God. Why? Because he knew what he was asking was not the will of God. Sometimes it's like that for us too. We try and ask God, we badger God, we just won't hear anything. That is a sign for us to say, God, hey, I'm, and is this the will of God I'm doing? And that was what happened. The moment Jesus, Jesus Christ realized that, ah, God doesn't want this, he changed his prayer. He says, not my will, but your will be done. So when you answer, when you pray, when you pray, God can say no. When you pray, God can say yes. Because he, that's what he has assured us. But also, when you pray, God may not say no, he may not say yes, he may say wait. Or God will just keep quiet. Meaning, until that you wait on me, until I answer you. So, what that tells us is that God will answer based on the season of your life. Somebody, or let's say a couple like Zechariah and Elizabeth. For many years, they prayed. They prayed to the point where it's like they became old and they gave up. Not knowing that God had scheduled a specific time. Six months ahead of the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. This is the time for you. That's why we can be assured that whenever it's your time, God will arise for you. He will show mercy upon you. He will show his greatness upon you. Number four, favor, like rain, is the precipitation of God's grace and mercy. It follows a life cycle. You know, I started, 
I, I studied geography. And one of the things that I is like we are taught is that water exists in three states. Water can be solid as ice. Water can be liquid as water. Water can be as gas as uh, vapor. And water is what is what was a life cycle. Where is like that water goes from from a uh, solid or from liquid that it goes into vapor. When water is vaporized, it rises into the sky. And once it gets to the sky, what happens is that it starts coagulating together in the sky. And then it got to the point where it's like it just become heavy for, for it to remain in the sky and it will fall as rain. You know, prayer is like that. There is a cycle of favor. Yeah, when we pray to God, God will answer us from heaven. Until is if the, in a place where there is, for example, the reason why is like in deserts. You ever you hardly ever see rain? It's because there is no water that will go from the ground into the sky and fall as rain. And what that tells us is this: that our life will be like a desert. If we refuse to pray and do what God wants us to do. Because prayer is the trigger, that thing that causes us to experience the grace of God. Prayer is important, as I will show us later, because it is a place of humility. So there is always a life cycle, a cycle of favor, a cycle of prayer resulting in favor, and then up, going up and down. So the more we pray, the more prayerful we are, the more of God's grace we experience. So when we are talking about favor rain, if you want to experience the rain of God's favor upon our lives, we need to learn to pray, to call upon God. Just call upon me, I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Those who know how to pray will understand what it means to experience the favor of God. Number five, every significant breakthrough you will ever experience will be the product of prayer. Every significant breakthrough, one thing that is something that I've experienced in my life, I have realized that whenever it's like I'm about to experience a breakthrough, I will be led to go into a time of fasting and prayer. I may fast for maybe two weeks, three weeks, or even 40 days. I remember it's like I, there was one in time I was just I was just seeking God because I wasn't really asking God for anything. I just said, Lord, I just want to spend this time with Him. And I fasted 40 days and I didn't do anything. I, I didn't expect anything. Only for but for me, about, just about two or three months later, I just had this dream. And that dream changed the direction of my life. I didn't know when I was just fasting there that I was preparing the ground for whatever God wants to do. So sometimes whenever God wants to, us to experience breakthroughs, he will, he will lead us to fast. He will lead us to pray so that we can pay the price of our prayer going up to heaven so that God can mediate that prayer and pour it down as favor upon us. So understand this, every significant impact you have must come through you having prayed it through. That's the way it's always worked. Even Jesus Christ. Why do you think that Jesus Christ was able to endure on the cross? It was because he prayed. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that he prayed so much that he said, Lord, pause. I remember, why was it that the disciples were unable to endure that trial at that point in time? He said, because they could not pray. You know, Jesus Christ said, pray for me so that you will pray with me so that you will not fall into temptation. So what that tells us is this, prayer is a way of stiffening our back so that it prepares us for whatever it is that the enemy wants to come against us. 
Whether we like it or not, we have to understand that we are, in, we are in spiritual warfare. And what that means is that there are times when God will allow things to happen in our lives that, that we are not prepared for. But if you are somebody who is prayerful, you know, it's, it's, it's like, for example, if let's say you are walking like this, and somebody just comes from behind you, you don't see the person, and the person pushes you. Because it's like you are not, you, you, you are not expecting it, you, the way you will fall will, be, will, will not be a good way. But supposing you know that somebody is coming from behind you, and you're able to see that person from the side of your, of your eye, what will you do? And you know that he wants to push you, you will stiffen yourself. That's what prayer does for us. When you are prayerful, it's not as if the devil will not attack you. But when he attacks you and push you, you won't just fall like that. Why? Because you didn't see it coming. That's part of God's favor for our lives. So why do we need to pray? We need to pray because prayer is what qualifies us for God's favor. Prayer qualifies us for God's favor. In Isaiah 66 verse 2, he says, This is the man upon whom I will have favor. He who is humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. Prayer is what it is that fulfills the first part, humility. The place of prayer is a place of humility. When we humble ourselves to God and say, God, I can't help myself, you've got to help me. The place of prayer is a place of weakness. Where we tell the Lord, I am so weak, I need your strength to help me. When we choose to pray, we are telling God that, look, I can't solve this situation myself, so I need you to help me to resolve it. So, we have to humble ourselves to pray. It is how God gets us to the state of readiness to receive his mercy. You know, sometimes we wonder, why is it that we have to pray? Sometimes we've been praying for so long and so long and since God is not doing anything. You know, the Israelites, you know, they've been praying, crying to God, even before Moses was born. Then Moses, when Moses was 40 years old, they were still praying. And Moses went down and said, Ah, let me help you, let me save you. And they said, Who, who born monkey? Who, who are you? Who made you a leader over us? They had to wait another 40 years of praying to God and saying, God, help us. Before they were able to receive Moses and say, Oh, yes, you are our leader. They had to get to the point where it's like they become desperate. They were so humbled by their circumstances. That when God showed them the deliverer, they quickly accepted him. It's the same thing with us. Sometimes we pray, but we are not ready to receive. We cry out to God and we say, God, why are you delaying? God says, I just want to go a little bit lower. A little bit lower because if God would answer us at that point in time, we say, ah, it's because I can pray. Oh, it is because of this. It's because I'm a clear warrior. Whereas God is just showing mercy on you. So God gets us to that point. Where is that we are so humbled? It's just like somebody like uh, Neman. You know, Neman was a man who was, because of protocol, he was a proud person. So you can imagine when he now went to the house of Elisha, Elisha did not even welcome him as somebody who is important. Elisha sent his servant, his help servant, he said, Tell him to go and, to go and wash. I mean, the, the guy felt insulted. Uh, even, uh, even he can't even ask me to come in. Even he, he can't even offer me a drink of water. Me in my stature. But the simple thing is this: stature or no stature, was a leper. That's the truth. Whatever you may be in life, whatever will cause you to want to pray to God shows that you need Him. So uh, he had to humble himself. He was he, look. He was even willing to go with his leprosy and go back home. But because of pride. That is the reason why God wants us to pray. So that God can impact our pride and submit it. So that we can open ourselves up by, to his grace. But because the Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So when we humble ourselves, we receive grace. That is favor. Number seven. 
for God to start or restart something in us, it requires us to change our status quo. And status quo ante is the way things are. If you want God to move in your life, understand that God expects you to do something that will cause him to move. The Bible says, so for yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. I studied agriculture, so I know what fallow, the fallow is. Whenever it's like the system that they practice in Israel, then for six years they will cultivate a, a plot of land. Then the seventh year, they won't do anything with the land. They will let it rest. When the land is resting and is not cultivated, it is in a fallow state. So for the next, after that year, they will cultivate it again for the next six years. When we are talking about, so fallow it is like cultivating the fallow ground, is bringing it back into production. You are saying, look, I am dissatisfied with the way things are. So what do you do? You start stealing the soil. Why is it necessary? The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, break up your fallow ground and do not sow in the thorns. Break up your fallow ground and do not sow in the thorns. In the story that Jesus Christ spoke about the sower, you know, some seeds fell by the wayside, some seeds fell on rocks, some seeds fell among thorns, and some seeds, they fell, is like in a, in a good soil. The seeds that fell among thorns, they grew up to a bit, but the thorns killed it. So when the Bible says that we should break up our fallow ground, prayer is a way of preparing ourselves, preparing our lives to remove every thorn that the enemy has planted in us, to destroy us, to ensure that we will not succeed. So when we break the fallow ground, we ready ourselves for what God has in store for us. We are able to ensure that whatever it is that God plants into our lives is able to produce 60-fold, 30-fold, and a 100-fold. So prayer is the place to be if you want to experience significance, if you want to experience success, if you want to, to, is like to produce to the maximum ability that God has placed in you. Number eight, God wants to guarantee our success. Prayer is how he does it. Whenever God wants to give you success, he will inspire you to pray. You know, before God will do anything, he always appoints somebody to pray. When God was about to send Jesus Christ into the world, He appointed two people, Simeon and Anna. And the Bible said that Anna would stay and pray in the temple for days, praying that God sent the deliverer. Any time that God will do something, God will bring somebody to pray. What that means is that when your time of, of favor is drawing near, you may feel the urge to start praying and say, God, help me. God, do this. God, do that. Why? Because God wants to, to change the status quo to help you to be able to guarantee that whatever it is that He's going to do will succeed. So, whenever God wants to guarantee to, to, to guarantee your success, He will need you to pray. Finally, when God says that He wants us to experience His favor, we must also understand, you know, there is this acronym, PUSH. It means pray until something happens. That's Hosea 10, 12. It says that break up your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord until He rains His righteousness upon us. 
What that tells us is that when we pray, we don't just pray and then say, oh, you pray two minutes and say, God, I prayed. Now, it's not impossible that God can answer your two minute prayer. But I want us to understand that the value of what you are asking God for determines the price that God will ask you to pay. If you're asking God for sweet, two minutes prayer may do it. But if you're asking God for a nation, two minutes prayer won't do it. That's why it's like there are different degrees of prayer. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 7 to 8, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Asking is just the preliminary thing. You know, you can go to a total stranger and ask something of them. You don't have to have a relationship with them. But to, to seek means that it's not just a one-time thing. You are pursuing them. So that means you build a relationship with them. You know, you know them better. That's why the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. So when you know you have a desire in your heart and you have asked God, nothing is happening. What God is saying is, that price is too small. Add more to it to seek me. And you know the thing about God is this. God wants us to fellowship with him. Sometimes God will purposely not answer us but because he wants to relate with us. You know the story of Jacob. I mean, the Bible says that Jacob fought with God. He fought with an angel of God throughout the night. Imagine, he fought. Yet, when the angel said, it's time for me to go, and Jacob said, ah, you can't go, you must bless me. You know what the, the angel did? Just put a finger in the tie, tie boat and, and dislocated it. You mean the guy that has been fighting for hours? He could, in, in a second, dislocate Joseph's uh, whatever. That shows that, look, it is not, it, it is not the fact that God cannot answer you. God is saying, spend time with me. That's just it. So, as we seek God, we spend more time with him. God may answer us. God may not answer us at that point in time. So, if you have been seeking God, and you, are, you need to go higher. You knock. If your friend calls you and says, David, I will be at your place in 30 minutes time. And exactly 30 minutes, somebody knocks on your door. And you say, ah, that must be James. Why? Because they preached. The time when is that when we are seeking, when we are praying, we've sought God so much, eventually we hit the jackpot. You say, ah, God, you are at your door. And God will open the door and invite you. That's when you have your breakthrough. That was what Daniel and his friends did. They prayed for 21 days until they had a breakthrough. So, my advice to you is this. If you want to experience God's favor, don't be too posh. To push. You know, some people, they are too posh. Me? Ah, no, no, no. And you know the thing about, you know, the labor room is, is, is the place where it's like you, you lose your, your dignity as a man. You don't even want to care whoever is there because you are in so much pain. But you know some people say, ah, no, sorry, ah, no, I can't do that. No, I want to have a CS instead. They are, they are what's called too posh to push. As Christians, whenever we get too posh to push, me, no, I can't pray. Ah, no, pastor will pray for me. Ah, no, 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 I will go and pray, I will go and pray some prophets to pray for me. You can never experience that breakthrough that God wants to have. So, I want to encourage you. The Bible says that God will arise and show mercy on Zion. For the time to favor has come. You are Zion. God wants to arise in you. But He needs you to ask Him, to invite Him, to pray. And say, Lord God, this is the situation I have. Lord, fight for me. When you do that, you experience God. Prayer is how we trigger God's divine favor. Do, do you 
have something that has been weighing you down. Maybe you have prayed before, but nothing is happening. I want to invite you to pray again. I say, Lord God, cause your rain to fall upon me. Cause your favor, oh Lord God, even to overshadow me. We are Lord God, I have been experiencing issues. Father Lord God, let me let there be a breaking through, a breaking forth for me, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. 